Where does the trans part of this all fit in? Because I remember years ago when people would say, when, I, when everyone started saying the LGBT community, mm -hmm. I remember thinking, I have no more insight into the T part of this mm -hmm. than a straight, cisgendered, heterosexual male would. You know what I mean? I, I just, I yeah. don't. I, I, maybe I have somehow slightly a little more inherent empathy by being mm -hmm. an outsider at some level, but I don't have any more knowledge of it. And now it seems like the trans issue has almost superseded all of the other issues, at least in the last year. I mean, everywhere, yeah. everywhere you go, there's, you know, every time I open the Twitter search bar, it's another trans story, or you know, someone's being fired for this joke or that. Or the other. <clears throat> what, what do you think happened there that catapulted this so quickly? And what are the issues around it that we're kind of afraid to talk about right now? It's a really complicated, fraught topic. Well, but that's why I I'm think, trying to get you involved, I think, so go like, the legitimate issue about trans is there are people who um, are trans or feel trans and they want their rights respected and that's totally legitimate and, mm -hmm. and good for them and raising awareness about that is fine. There's a much larger group of people who I think are using trans issues as a kind of wedge to destroy uh, the gender binary or to kind of muddy the waters or basically as a weapon to beat up evolutionary psychology hmm. or evolutionary biology to say there's no such thing as sex, really. There's no such thing as biological sex or sex is totally dissociated from gender, et cetera. So when someone says that, and the next time someone says that mm -hmm. on Twitter, what's the answer that, that the person watching this should give? That Maybe Twitter's not the best uh, one for it. I mean, male and female are evolved strategies that exist because over thousands of generations, they were like the paths to successful reproduction. Um, if you're not clearly male and functioning as a male, or you're not clearly female and functioning as a female, you're, you're a genetic dead end. So selection hammers against any ambiguity there. So it's not surprising that the vast majority of humans alive today clearly identify as one sex or the other. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean everyone should, it doesn't have any kind of moral implications about that, but just descriptively, it means there is a gender binary and it evolved for good reasons. And everyone who teaches biology hopefully knows this. And it shouldn't be that for controversial, now. right? <laughs> now, if we wanna like genetically engineer people and use CRISPR and whatever to, destroy the gender binary for the 22nd and 23rd centuries. We could do that, we could talk about that. Um, I don't have any particular attachment to the kind of male-female dichotomy ethically. Um, but I think descriptively, it's really important to kind of accept it and, and to go, it, it's here, it's valuable to understand and we shouldn't necessarily try to pretend it out of existence um, or pretend that we're doing it in the name of trans rights. Right? You right. can have trans rights without saying there's no such thing as sex. So this gets to the heart of what I think is really happening in this country right now, which is everything has become politicized to the point that the experts in the field seem afraid to talk about <clears> these <throat> issues. You right now are, are taking a risk mm -hmm. by talking mm -hmm. about these issues. Yeah. Are you seeing this across the board? Are you, are you seeing this amongst colleagues, a fear to talk about these things? Yeah, absolutely. Now, the vast majority of people, like at my university, don't really touch upon anything that's particularly politicized, right? They're just teaching civil engineering or law or um, immunology or whatever. And most of that isn't really politicized yet. However, yet is the key word, yet, there, right? Right. Yeah, okay. It, I mean, you get a little bit of, bit about what's the gender representation in certain fields, but in my department in psychology, you do get almost everything having a kind of political edge. And I have colleagues who are frightened to teach certain classes. Like I teach psychology of human sexuality and I'm I'm pretty upfront and outspoken about what I cover and, and what my view is, but a lot of my colleagues will not touch it with a barge pole. 
because there's so much risk that students will just get upset about one little thing you say yeah. and complain to a dean, and then you'll get called into the office. And um, So what would be that type of thing, beyond what you just said about the need yeah. and the evidence of, of gender mm -hmm. differences? What, what are the other type of things that just talking about are scaring the academics? It's very awkward to talk about sex differences in any mental traits or motivations or preferences. It's hard to talk about sexual coercion, rape, date rape, harassment, stalking, mm -hmm. etc. That must be an incredibly difficult one at college. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard to talk about um, aggression in general, either between individuals or between groups, and how that relates to sexuality. Like why hunter-gatherer tribes go to war, right? It's not typically about land or food, it's about women. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't fit the kind of Marxist picture of prehistoric warfare, mm -hmm. right? And then if you talk about stuff like um, pregnancy, childcare, parenting, are you being, you know, overly pronatalist and sort of family values for talking about that stuff? Mm -hmm. Is that alienating to certain students who might be homosexual or infertile or, or adopted kids or whatever? Um, but it's, it's so interesting because I obviously hear these types of stories from mm -hmm. academics all the time, not only in here, but, but online, and people email me all the time, mm -hmm. and it's like, God, We've failed. I mean, the universities really have failed at that point. Like, if you're afraid to talk about child rearing because that might upset a gay person, yeah, Jesus. I mean, what's left at that point? It's so frustrating, and it means I feel bad for the students, but I also feel bad for the parents who are often footing the tuition yeah. bill because the parents have faith that if I send my kid to a state university and I pay tens of thousands in tuition and they take a course on topic X, like human sexuality, that they're gonna get professors who are willing to profess to say what they really think. And often they're not getting that. So there's a kind of bait and switch where universities are pretending to be these bastions of free speech and inquiry and, and honesty. And in fact, um, everyone's kind of running scared and these kids are not getting our best insights. They're paying the money, but we're not delivering the service. How much of an infection, not just in the classroom, do you see this as, but I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you've written around 110 published papers. Is that right? Did I get the exact number right? Is it 100? More or less. More, yeah. more, more or less. You lose count yeah. at some point. Um, I'm sure you're well aware of the Peter Bogosian mm -hmm. led Sokol hoax, mm -hmm. that it's not just what's happening in the classroom that's causing the chaos, but it actually may be what's happening before that related yeah. to all of these papers mm -hmm. that at certain disciplines basically have, mm -hmm. I don't think I'm overestimating, they almost have no standards yeah. at this point. That has that got to be just incredibly frustrating for someone that actually has published some things legitimately. It, it's kind of frustrating, but... I can see you don't get frustrated easily, but... Um... Like, it doesn't bug me as much as maybe it bugs some other people, partly because I spent a lot of my undergraduate um, years taking courses on critical theory, and I read a lot of Derrida and Foucault and Lyotard and all those French dudes, and one reason I loved those courses is it was so easy to get an A yeah. by writing a <laughs> kind of <laughs> bullshit paper using the right terms, uh -huh. <clears throat> And using sufficiently obscure syntax, right? That uh, so I know that game. God, that's real. It's very really well. Real, that it's thing. really real. Yeah. And it's great fun. I understand the appeal <laughs> of that stuff. It's just I can't imagine spending my adult life doing nothing but that. And that's what's happening in a lot of the humanities. So it like if if those folks want to do that and and get paid typically not a very good salary to do that. I don't, it doesn't really viscerally offend me. Mm -hmm. The only danger is when, is when they turn into activists and they give people like me grief based on not understanding what I do. Yeah. Well, I would imagine a lot of it just then leaks into your classroom and then, then all bets are off. 
It's weird, it doesn't actually leak in. No? Like when I teach human sexuality, right? The kids have a sort of vague um, political correctness that they've absorbed mostly in K through 12 public school, I think. But if you actually ask them, have you had any courses on gender feminism? No. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of any of these leading figures from critical theory or history of feminism or even history of gay rights they know nothing about? So it's not like they've been indoctrinated, at least not in big state schools, but they've kind of soaked up some stuff from high school, I think, hmm. that influences how they interpret everything. So as two guys wearing, might I say, very nice shirts right now, a shiny purple shirt and a shiny blue shirt, mm -hmm. let's talk about evolutionary aesthetics. Cool. People don't talk about aesthetics yeah. that much, but you think that sort of the things we're looking at in the West are maybe not as exciting as they should be and that there's a problem there. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I've been really into art for a long time, and I think art and beauty are important, um, particularly the places people live and work. And I think as humans, we kind of deserve the best from artists, interior designers, um, stylists, whatever, architects that make our lives as pleasant as possible. And I think basically ever since about 1910, art and architecture has failed hmm. and has not done a very good job of delivering visual environments that are actually humane and appealing and enjoyable and that kind of promote mental and physical health. What happened around 1910? Modernism, man. <laughs> um, if you look at the way domestic architecture worked up until about that period, it was all sort of human scale and arts and crafts. And um, there are places you'd want to live where you didn't have to be educated into a particular elite notion of what a house should be in order to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Right, and then you get the Bauhaus, international modernism, white structures, crisp hard lines, um, bad acoustics, and suddenly that becomes the fashion, mm -hmm. right? And that becomes what people think are is the future, and nobody likes it. Yeah, but it's kind of imposed top down by the elite. You must live like this, like it or not. Is, is that top down for, from the elite or is that just that often those things are just easier to build probably and cheaper to build? Or maybe that's the same thing actually. Well, the irony is like, you could have taken cheap, easy to build reinforced concrete structures mm -hmm. and built a lot of awesome cheap houses that were okay. Or you could do the traditional route. But instead what you get is every house must be distinct and must have its own shape. Mm -hmm. And there can't be any um, standardization. So the houses end up being expensive and experimental and hard to maintain and they leak and everyone's miserable. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not really serving the needs of the, the people at large. They're just great for architect egos. Yeah, it's interesting because I just spent a couple of months bouncing through a lot of different countries in Europe, and mm -hmm. you know, especially in, well, in most of these countries because the history goes back so far. You see yeah. incredible architecture. You see even mm -hmm. you know I see chairs that were mm -hmm. 150 years old and like the woodwork that would go into it and the craftsmanship, mm -hmm. and it was like I don't think we could do this today. Or if we could do it today, mm -hmm. this would have this chair would be in our dollars. It would be like a six thousand five hundred dollar chair where yeah. back then. You know, this is what a guy did. It mm -hmm. took him a couple days and he could sell it mm -hmm. and earn a wage. And it's like, we've just, the economics of everything have gotten out of whack. Yeah, and like, nice table here. Yeah. And this slab, probably, this is, this is the new, the you slab. commented on the table right when you walked in, so I know you mean it, yeah. Um, I've made a few pieces of furniture in my day and that, that's pretty cool. But yeah, it was the visual art in particular. Um, the economics mean like abstract painting just, is so much faster to do than representational painting, right? If you're a young aspiring artist and you want a career and you want to give your gallery a certain flow of work that they can sell, it's a lot harder to do that if you're doing representational paintings mm -hmm. that take 100, 300 hours than mm -hmm. an abstract work that takes a tenth of that. So the economic pressures are also in that direction. Yeah. Um, 
but people have um, kind of voted with their feet and like they don't like elite abstract art. They don't like conceptual art. Um, but is, is like the word the right word there, or they just mm -hmm. don't they just don't know, or it's conditioning, or it's that we all like to like what everybody else likes, sort of thing. I think everybody knows that they're kind of supposed to enjoy going to like. Well, we're visiting this city. We should go to the Contemporary Art Museum, and they get there, mm. and there's a bunch of terrible video art, <laughs> and there's a bunch of very puzzling conceptual art. And they read the little descriptions on the walls and they go, this makes no sense because it's written by an art curator for other art curators. Mm -hmm. And it's all completely alienating. And that's, that's sad because it means they're being told this is the highest expression of your culture, but it's completely inaccessible to you. So what, uh, what do you look at that gives you some excitement or can still sort of renew your spirit, let's say. Well, there, there is a movement of kind of neo-traditionalism in, in art, hmm. where there's, there's certain places like New York Academy of Arts that are actually teaching students how to draw and paint and sculpt and, and do the sort of traditional um, skills that people associate with art. Um, it's just a little hard to get a foothold in the, like the New York or London gallery system mm -hmm. if that's the kind of work that you do. Um, but my hope is that like the Bay Area billionaires will start collecting that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Chinese art market is, has got a real thirst for good representational art. Mm. And I think that's going to start to dominate the art world pretty soon. So what's the evolutionary need mm -hmm. for good art? I mean, what's the psychological? I mean, I know you're, you're, you're okay. There's an expression of something that yeah. can't quite be said, but what's like the, the driving force behind that? So yeah, on the one hand, there's why do we bother to make art? On the other hand, why, why do we like certain kinds of art? Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot more research on why do we like certain kinds of patterns and colors and forms and compositions and whatever. But there's no sort of unified theory of, of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would say there's more good stuff published on that topic between about 1870 and 1920 than since. Because mm -hmm. that's when mm -hmm. people were sort of very inspired by Darwin. Evolutionary aesthetics was a field. There were dozens of books published on it. And then modernism came and everyone forgot all that. How could this be connected to the earlier topic, which is sexuality? So for example, my mm -hmm. gay male friends, generally yeah. speaking, Mm -hmm. have a much better eye for art or for style or for fashion, Yeah, you know? <clears throat> you could get away in that crew, you know what I mean? Like, you got a nice Thank jacket you. on, you got a nice shirt, like that's, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, that is a compliment. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. where, gen again, just broadly speaking, it's like my straight guy friends all kind of wear big shirts and they don't know exactly how to do their hair and they're, you know? So there's some yeah. connection between sexuality and artistic mm -hmm. vision. I think that's absolutely true, and it's not what you would predict from first principles. It's really weird. If you look around at other species, the males are typically much more ornamented mm -hmm. than the females. Mm -hmm. They have the, the amazing plumage, and they do the incredible songs and dances, and the females are usually kind of drab and, and not that aesthetic. The bowerbirds that make these incredible kind of installation works, that's all the males. Then you get to humans, or at least American males, American straight males, and it's like, can't you even find clothes that fit? <laughs> or like colors that it's the big work. Shirts. And like, what is up with your house, you know? And when I did well, the- this is um, why Jordan Peterson sold two million copies to tell people to clean mm -hmm. their room. Yeah. So I have no idea why gay men have better taste than straight men. I think that's a fascinating There's issue. some, there has to be some There's link something there. going yeah. on there. Um, but I think men can level up, obviously, because like British and European men aren't as hopeless. If you grow up a young man in Italy, you kind of absorb some ideas about style. And even the British 
um, kind of aristocrats, landed gentry class, ha have a certain look that it's a bit traditionalist, but at least there's taste. I don't know if this is going to quite make sense, but were we almost getting there, say, 10 years ago with the rise mm -hmm. of the metrosexual? Yeah. And then it sort of crashed because I guess maybe it mm -hmm. relates back to what you said at the beginning about where we are more Puritan. So yeah. there was this idea, there was this like mocking of them like, ah, they're just mm -hmm. gay, but don't want mm -hmm. to admit it or something like that. And that whole thing seemed to crash. Like there yeah. was this little brief window where straight guys were like dressing better or yeah. had cooler haircuts or something, something there. Well, even five years ago when I lived in New York for a, a little bit and uh, I hung out, uh, hung out a lot in Brooklyn, there was sort of, that was peak hipster in, in Brooklyn. And the guys there, the straight guys, put a lot of effort into grooming and haircuts and authentic style and like, this or that is in fashion. And I thought, this is really cool. This is like a Europeanization of male taste and culture. But it was also very masculine. Mm -hmm. It wasn't sort of like late 70s disco culture or early 90s rave culture mm -hmm. or or Burning Man culture. It was sort of more old school masculine. It's old like school, yeah. like I want to go to a proper barber and get a proper haircut. Yeah. And like it's all flannel and boots and whatever. And I love that stuff. Um, but I think it kind of had its moment. Uh, and evaporated, I don't know. It's I think in that every, case they just priced themselves out of the market in Brooklyn right. probably, something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, or they just got all too busy on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> well, that it always <laughs> comes back to that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about mate selection. Mm -hmm. Regardless of your, of your sexuality, there seems to be this new thing right now where if you're not open to dating absolutely anyone under mm -hmm. any circumstances, no matter how they look or how they take care of themselves or whether they brush their teeth mm -hmm. or whether they have a penis or a vagina mm -hmm. or any combination of anything, that if you are just open to anything, there's mm -hmm. a, a pretty loud and growing voice out there that is trying to frame everyone as a, as a yeah. bigot, yeah. which is the reverse of what choosing mm -hmm. a mate really has been about. It's insane. I mean, for 500 million... <laughs> All right, million, I got you. I got emotional <laughs> Miller. There we for go. 500 million years, right, our vertebrate ancestors have been choosing their mates selectively because that is the highest stakes decision any organism makes is who do I recombine my genes with, right? And so all the way through the chordates and the vertebrates and the mammals and the primates, you get particularly females being choosy about you know, who they breed with, who sires their kids. But then as soon as humans start doing pair bonds, million, two million years ago, and the males start investing more in offspring, start forming longer term relationships, then we also have incentives to be choosy about our female mates. And so this is the one domain where if you have even a, a shred of libertarian in you, or you respect freedom of association at all, or you think it's okay to care who you spend your life with and like what kind of children you, you create, then mate choice should be a kind of domain of freedom. Right, like this is a good place to be prejudiced, so to speak, right? Yeah. Like you should have some uh, You should be, dis be discriminating, yeah. have judgment. Discriminating um, taste. And you can always be open to the idea that maybe the current set of criteria that I have maybe could be nudged or improved or tweaked, or maybe I'm subject to certain stereotypes and maybe I could overcome those. True, of course, people tend to get better at mate choice in their 30s than in their teens. But for someone to start lecturing you politically, like, you shouldn't be attracted to women. You should be attracted to anybody or any any kind of being or in what any species, any age. Like, no, let please let me be attracted to who I'm attracted to. Because that should be like the the pinnacle of human freedom. Yeah. Really if if you don't believe in freedom anywhere else, you should believe in mate choice freedom. It should be a fundamental human right, I think. And where you get horrible totalitarian societies really infringing on mate choice freedom, like you're not allowed to marry that person, or you know you have to do an arranged marriage to that person, we kind of recoil at that 
and go, that's horrible. And yet in America, we have busybodies and virtue signalers um, telling us your mate choice criteria are too narrow. So where do gay people fit in all of this then? At a biological or an evolutionary perspective, you've brought up the point of passing on genes many times. Now, mm -hmm. gay couples or mm -hmm. gay people, whether you're a couple or not, don't do that, at mm -hmm. least biologically speaking. Yep. Um, so what, what do you make of that condition? Is that even the right word? Now I'm gonna get I'm gonna get us both in trouble probably just for me asking the question. And... Let's call it a trait. Trait. Trait's pretty neutral. Okay. All right. Trait's pretty neutral. Well, here's a fascinating thing about homosexuality is people have been developing or trying to develop theories of male homosexuality and its kind of evolutionary origins and functions for 30, 40 years, and there is no good theory of it yet. It's a complete mystery. I've never seen any compelling explanation of male homosexuality. So, so what would be a compelling argument? A compelling or, argument yeah. would be, okay, there's costs of being like exclusively attracted to your own sex and therefore not typically having as many kids, mm -hmm. but there's some countervailing benefits of some sort, maybe benefits to your extended family or benefits to your group or something else, but nobody can make the math work. Hmm enough to, to kind of explain that. Um, female bisexuality is much easier, right? You can go, well, as long as a woman is sometimes attracted to men enough to have kids, then also being attracted to women it might be no cost at all, or it might even be a benefit in terms of social networking, making friends. Mm -hmm. Sex is a great way to make friends. Um, if a lot more males were bisexual, that would be equally easy to explain. Um, it's the exclusive homosexuality that's very hard to explain. It certainly exists. It exists at a, you know, a percentage that's much, much higher than you can explain as just, well, it's just mutations or it's just maladaptive. Mm -hmm. Like that won't work. So this is where I'll be kind of epistemically humble and say, man, I have no idea. Huh. It's, an, it's a fascinating problem. Maybe somebody will crack it within 10 or 20 years. Right. It's interesting because if you were coming at it from another perspective, like a religious mm -hmm. perspective, let's mm -hmm. say, you would find that to be mm -hmm. a moral quandary that then you could extrapolate yeah. all sorts of different judgments on. Yeah. But I can see the way you answer it. It's like, just is a thing. Yeah. Maybe we'll get more data on it, mm -hmm. but it is. But what do you make of the fact that there are seemingly mm -hmm. many more bisexual women where I don't know any gay couple that one of the guys is mm -hmm. sneaking out at night to bang a right. woman. You know right. what I mean? I've, yeah. I've never heard of that. But yep. you have heard of obviously straight mm -hmm. couples where the mm -hmm. guy is, mm -hmm. you know, on the DL or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my girlfriend Diana Fleischman has a whole theory of female bisexuality that's that's to do with the, the social networking benefits. Mm -hmm. um, but then the question is, yeah, why don't the men do that too? Because like if if you're a guy and you kind of swing both ways, then like doing gay sex can be a great way to make male friends also. And it's... Well, now I know we have our, uh, our promo for the show. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so in a way, the quandary isn't why do any male homosexuals exist? The quandary is why aren't all males and females bisexual? Mm -hmm. And do you think some of that years from now, we might look back and go, whoa, that's just societal pressure? It might be. I think Certainly, there's a huge amount of stigma against male bisexuals from both sexes, mm -hmm. um, but especially women. Um, female bisexuality used to be stigmatized maybe 30 years ago, not so much anymore. Yeah. So it that could change. What, what are some of the other topics that are that are really on your mind these days? Let, let's hit up. Effective altruism. Things. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've had many guests on talking about effective altruism, but not, it's not a ton, actually. It, it's sort of my hot topic of the last few years. So it, it's a social movement, a, a moral movement. It's some of the smartest young people I've ever met. And their basic goal in life is do the most good they can based on reason and evidence, 
rather than sentimentality and virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. I've done a little bit of this sort of in an ancillary way with some mm -hmm. of the libertarians that I've yeah. done. Yeah. yeah. And so the kind of major domains they tend to focus on are things like how do we get charities to be more effective at reducing global poverty or promoting global public health? How do we overcome factory farming and be nice to animals and promote animal welfare? And so a lot of the effective altruists are vegan um, for ethical reasons. And then a lot of them are focused on just survival of the species. How do we reduce existential risks to humanity like nuclear war, bioweapons, um, and artificial intelligence risks. So maybe the most distinctive thing they have is this kind of ultra long-term perspective that's like, we are just these transient little beings. The thing that really matters is what does humanity turn into? How long do we last? Do we colonize the universe or do we fail? And the folks who think most seriously about that think it's actually that last thing, minimizing existential risk that is absolutely crucial and everything else is just kind of fluff and bullshit. So is this where like the transhumanist mm -hmm. crew would sort of fit within mm -hmm. this? Is there a risk? So I love this stuff because I'm a sci-fi guy. Every, mm -hmm. I mentioned Philip K. Dick before. I mean, every yeah. one of his stories or books are about the inevitability mm -hmm. of all of these things. Is there a risk though of always looking mm -hmm. at what's beyond the horizon instead mm -hmm. of going on right now? I don't really think there's a risk unless like the vast majority of humans became effective altruists. There's already so many people who are obsessed with, um, you know, diversity and equity and inclusion and economic growth and all the ordinary problems that politicians talk about. Like that's covered. There's already a lot of smart people working on that. The, the big neglected topics tend to be the kind of science fiction-y topics where you need a sort of cadre of genius Aspies, <laughs> right, to work on it when nobody else is taking it seriously. Yeah, well, speaking of the Aspies, that's, that's an mm -hmm. interesting one if we wanted to get into one that's mm -hmm. a, little, a little controversial as well. Um, what, what is that all about mm -hmm. that so many of the creators mm -hmm. now or mm -hmm. the people that are coming out of the tech world, even though you can obviously make plenty of arguments that the tech mm -hmm. world is now in this sort of implosion and certainly not the creative place it was, yeah. say, 10 years ago, but that so much creativity came out of a world that had so many people that were seemingly uncreative. Mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating. Um, I sort of identify as moderately Aspie myself, kind of high-functioning Asperger's, and I've written some stuff about how... Um, neurodiversity issues like being Aspie kind of rub up against free speech issues. Because like Can you explain that over? people who are Aspie don't always do a good job of understanding the beliefs and desires of other people and particularly what they might find offensive, mm -hmm. right? So they might just say something. So they might just say sh whatever. shit and then yeah. be really surprised that it was distressing to someone. And so if you have a model of speech that says you must never cause offense, that assumes you can anticipate what will cause offense. And a lot of people can't anticipate that because mm -hmm. their brains don't work that way. So you either need to say, okay, Aspies, you can never say anything, or cut them some slack and say, we understand you'll offend people once in a while, but that's okay because that's your, just that's part of your deal. Man, I've never thought about this, but does this somehow explain what's going on in Silicon Valley right now? You have a bunch of people mm -hmm. who are somewhat socially awkward, let's say, yeah. who created incredible technology that allowed us to all connect, but then when voices that aren't supposed to, mm -hmm. aren't supposed to, that's a horrible way of framing it, when voices that are a little out there or a little contrarian or whatever, that might yeah. include us actually, mm -hmm. get out there, the only way they can deal with it is to shut that voice off or something like that. Like, which yeah. is why we're seeing so much deplatforming and silencing. And the right, they have to be overly systematizing about it. They, they have to be like, oh man, I can't, I can't navigate these gray areas hmm. if I'm running a social media platform or Patreon or whatever. Right. So I'm gonna just have a hard and fast rule that says, 
if I get enough complaints, I deplatform that person. Or um, I don't know the difference between porn and erotica and just slightly sexy art, so I'm going to say no nipples mm -hmm. or wh whatever. That's a kind of aspie response to getting blowback from people where you, like, you don't really know why they're upset. So in a weird way, if you have a bunch of the creators of Silicon Valley that mm. are coming from that world, and then you suddenly bring in a bunch of executives that come from the social justice world, mm -hmm. that really shows like a, a, that's a match made in hell right It's there. just matter, antimatter. Yeah, it's, um, it's terrible. And what I hoped would happen is that maybe five or 10 years ago, it seemed like Hot, like tech is dominating culture generally, and tech is dominated by Aspies. So, hopefully, Aspie values uh -huh. of being kind of tolerant and eccentric and nerdy and like getting weird little enthusiasms that that would kind of trickle down and create a more tolerant hmm. culture. Is that what you would have predicted, say, ten years ago? Yeah. Really? And instead, you have the opposite. You yeah. have the, the social justice activists taking over and basically saying, all of that quirky freedom that you, you Aspie people value, we're going to legislate that away. You, you can't have that. Um, and it's, it's tragic. I hope the pendulum swing, swings back, but um, as long as the leaders of the social media platforms don't have the guts to say, look, this is our people, um, outspoken, eccentric, slightly socially oblivious people, and that's okay. And the rest of you just have to kind of suck it up and deal with it. That's what they should be doing. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm at the point with all this, and you know how frustrated <clears throat> I've been with YouTube and Twitter and Patreon and the whole thing. I'm really at the point of this where I actually mm -hmm. believe that that solution is gone. Mm -hmm. I don't think it can come from the top anymore. Yeah. I, I really don't believe that. I think that thing mm -hmm. has become so corroded that I would say the mm -hmm. only way it can come is now from the bottom, mm -hmm. that the people will basically rise up against these things. And I know that's like, mm -hmm. it's sort of pie in the sky because what does that even mean? Do we all sign off on the same day? Do we all, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that means. But I almost see that as the only way to do this because they've had, we've done everything else or, or the government will get involved and mm -hmm. that certainly rings all the bells that I'm not happy with on my libertarian side. Yeah, I, I, I think at least in terms of universities, the only solution to, to some of the university problems is the government actually saying, at least to the public universities mm -hmm. that are in principle bound by the constitution, you guys have to obey the first amendment yeah. or you lose federal funding. I think that's the only leverage. Yeah. And I was really kind of hoping that POTUS would do that at some point in the last year or two. I'm pretty disappointed that he hasn't. Mm -hmm. Well, but in he, a weird way, he almost benefits the more that they go against it, right? Yeah. Because that feeds his base of yeah. know, aggrieved and politically correct. Yeah. You know, that they see political correctness running amok. Yeah. Something like that. Um, all right, before we finish up, give me, give me one thing. We're at the beginning of 2019 right now. Mm -hmm. Give me one thing that we should be sort of thinking about that we're not mm -hmm. thinking about right now. I love the thought experiment of like, once Elon Musk succeeds and we start colonizing Mars, what, what are the relationships and social structures in the Mars colonies gonna look like? I'm fascinated by this, mm -hmm. this issue. Like, yeah, that's are, cool. are the colonies gonna be like communist utopias? Are they gonna be libertarian um, aspirational states? Are they is everyone going to do monogamous lifelong marriage? Is it going to be crazy, polyamorous, kinky stuff? I think it's great to think about this stuff before we attempt it. And I think Mars is going to be this amazing experiment where like this colony gets formed based on these social and sexual assumptions and this one gets formed and this one fails catastrophically mm -hmm. or, or it just, like, it doesn't work well enough and it just borrows the organization of this other place. So I think it'll be this incredible kind of behavioral science laboratory. And I can't Dare wait Dare I to say that's not too far from the way the America was set up, right? That the states exactly. were supposed to be mm -hmm. those places of experiment. Yeah. 
Um, it's yeah, it's the way the East Coast was 200, 250 years ago, and I think um, the difference now is the colonies will be able to communicate with each other and with us and be able to measure a bunch of outcomes and deliberately experiment. And I think we need to kind of get out ahead of that and start like rereading all of our classic science fiction and figuring mm. out how is this going to apply for reals now, now that we do it. Yeah, which is so related to why you think art is important mm -hmm. because fiction is just as important. I mean, you realize it all ends with that eventually they figure it mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. they have their tea party, and then we blow them up. Like, yeah, but they do beautiful Art Nouveau <laughs> like domes in the meanwhile. Yeah, Jeffrey, I'm so glad we finally did this. Yeah, and let's me too. do it again for sure. And if you want to see a good combination of bright, smart thought and snark on Twitter, follow mm -hmm. Jeffrey at Primal Poly.